So, welcome to the uh, final session of uh, Battle of Ideas 2019. Uh, I'm Alistair Donald, I'm the Associate Director of the Academy of Ideas and I've been the co-convener of the festival this year along with Ella Whelan. Um, so this session uh, is called After Brexit, The New Political Fault Lines and it's a, uh, part of the strand, a battle for democracy, the battle for democracy, uh, which has been in this room, uh, taking place in this room all day. Uh, organised uh, with our partners, uh, UK and the Changing Europe, um, who've uh, been very useful in terms of trying to uh, understand and develop some of the uh, questions for this session. Um, I think the way to understand this session is it's a little bit of a follow-on to a session that we had before where we started to look at uh, what the question of Brexit meant in terms of the establishment and whether it was a, re a revolt against the establishment or by the establishment. And all sorts of uh, useful questions came out of that, most or, or a lot of which I think uh, we reached fairly tentative but uh, uh, not complete answers. So I think we can pick up uh, some of those uh, questions again. Um, I, d I gave a very loose brief to, to my panel, which was uh, just really to try and pick up on some of the emerging uh, uh, social trends and cultural trends and political trends. Obviously, we're positioned now within a general election period to, so to try and uh, take a look at what that meant in, in electoral and political party terms. Um, and really just to, to try and understand uh, where it is that we might go and uh, should go in, in the next period as, as we uh, uh, start to try and take stock of what Brexit might mean and you know, whether it's delivered or not, kind of how we move on uh, from this period. So I'm going to introduce my panel uh, in the order that they're going to speak. Um, some of them are fairly late additions, so I'm going to push them towards the end uh, just to give them a little bit more time to think. So we're going to kick off... Uh, sorry? Yeah, okay. We're going to kick off with uh, Professor Anna Menon uh, from UK and the Changing Europe, um, who I, th I think uh, I've introduced before, so I'm not going to say very much more about you, except uh, you can see the full biogs of everyone on the panel uh, on the Battle of Ideas website. Um, on my far right, we've got uh, Lord Morris Glassman, who's a Labour Life peer in the House of Lords and the author of Unnecessary Suffering, Managing Market Utopia. Uh, and he's director of the Common Good Foundation uh, and widely associated with uh, Blue Labour. So thanks to you, Morris. Um, who, Joan, we'll put Joan third. Uh, uh, so Joan Hoey is director, uh, Europe, the Economist Intelligence Unit, uh, which is the business information arm of the Economist Group. Uh, Joan's the editor of the EIU Democracy Index, where she reads, leads a team of 15 analysts uh, forecasting political and economic developments across 50 countries. Um, fourth will be Rachel Cunliffe, uh, who's the political and business journalist at City AM, uh, who are one of the media partners for Battle of Ideas, and I should check out actually some of the articles that they've carried in the run-up to the festival. Um, and Rachel uh, specialises in British and American politics uh, at the intersection of kind of business and policy. I think. Uh, and finally, uh, we've got Anne McElvoy, who's a senior editor at The Economist, uh, head of Economist Radio, uh, and presenter of Free Thinking on Radio 3, and also a panelist for The Moral Maze on Radio 4. So I've um, asked them just to give us a few opening remarks, uh, five minutes at the most. I'll, I'll kind of hold you to that, uh, and then we'll come straight out for questions, and we could get a bit of a discussion going uh, after that. So, Anand, off to you. Thank you very much. I'm going to start with the, with the title of the session and work my way around to the questions we're being asked, which strike me as being slightly separate. Uh, the, question, the title is about new political fault lines, and of course the new political fault line in our politics is the division over Brexit, which corresponds broadly to a sort of uh, values division in our society. And one of the striking things that's happened to our politics post-Brexit is that Brexit identities seem to have become stronger than political identities. So 80% of the public say they have a strong Brexit identity, while only 40% claim to have a strong party identity. Uh, and there is profound hostility between the two camps, and actually more hostility from Remain towards Leave than vice versa. So around 50% of Leavers say Remainers are closed-minded, while about 70% of Remainers say the same about Leavers. So there is no love lost between the two camps. 
Now, the big question for our politics is the degree to which this Brexit division starts to take over from the traditional left-right division of our politics. Now, there are some clues from 2017. If you think back to 2017, that we were forced to say phrases that we never thought we'd have to say in our adult lives, like the Tories win Stoke or Labour wins Kensington. And that was partly, mainly, the, the sort of Brexit impact on our politics. But if you dig into the numbers from 2017, what becomes clear is that ultimately, that left-right division, social class, was the dominant aggregate factor that pushed people to vote the way they did. We do not know whether that will be the case in this election. Twice the number of people in, this, uh, as in the last election are saying Brexit will determine who they will vote for now. But the campaign hasn't yet started. And bear in mind that tribal political loyalties are very, very sticky. So only around 10% of those 2017 Labour voters who say they have a strong Leave identity are willing to even consider voting Conservative. And the same applies the other way around. So we don't know how sticky these identities will prove to be. A lot will, will hinge on how this election is framed. If it's, man if it's framed as a Brexit election, we can expect the normal patterns of politics to disperse more than they did in 2017. If it isn't, then actually I think we might end up being surprised how sticky those political loyalties are. But for me, the big question about our politics actually is how these Brexit tribes coalesce on socio-economic issues. In our last panel, when we talked about whether Brexit was a revolt against the establishment or against the status quo, one of the things we pointed out was a lot of people voted Brexit because they were unhappy with the state of the country, the state of its politics, the state of its economy in 2016. The problem that faces the Leave Coalition is that it is made up of groups with fundamentally contradictory economic interests. So cobbling together some kind of coherent socioeconomic platform out of that is going to be the devil's own job. At the moment, we have all politicians talking a good game around the issues that the referendum raised. I mean, the Conservatives have discovered buses, for heaven's sake. That shows the degree to which our politics have changed. What things will really hinge on, I suspect, going forward is whether anyone is willing to deliver on these kind of rhetorical pledges they're making, and that ultimately will, will determine what the permanent new fault lines in our politics are, if indeed they manage to change at all. Okay, thanks, Anand. Um, so, Morris, on to you. Sure, um, thanks. So, just f first to say that, as with a lot of academic stuff that begins with the word after, it's a bit optimistic to... to um, that's still up in the air, um, but but certainly if if it if it was the case that there was a, a a break with the EU, the first the first fault line I think is going to be the traditional one of class and political economy. Um, that's going to be the so what what Anand said said there is that that is the future fault line of politics is is that once. Um, without the EU, and it's just important to say, you know, what it is why the EU is such a powerful and is such a powerful institution. It, it, it is the embodiment of globalisation in terms of it, it, its attitude to markets, the procedural state, multinational liberal constitutions, and, and the ideas of technology uh, transcending borders. Um, it has a conception of a legal order in which democracy is a bit part player where you can't change the constitutional order. Once that's broken, um, what will emerge, I am, I am sure, um, is a new pol a political economy of class um, that will challenge the last 40 to 50 years in, in which there's been very little possibility to have an industrial strategy, deep and economic democracy, um, and address the regional disparities. So, so that's, that's the... The first fault line and the overwhelming fault line will be around class and the political economy. Um, the second one will be over, over I think, uh, politics and and also a constitutional politics. Whether the whether it's going to be an idea of of a global order or a, or a local order, whether it's going to be a renewal of the ancient constitution with parishes and wards and or whether it's going to be much more that of a procedural justice mm -hmm. framework. And I think that that's, that's alive and living at the moment, the relationship between democracy and the law, whether it's going to be about the separation of the powers 
or a renewal of the balance of interest within, within the old political order. And then it's also going to be a, a cultural issue about the predominance or domination of, of liberalism as the prime force. And once again, this is going to be uh, framed as a conflict between the local and the global and, and whether the local has the resources to challenge the domination of both the educated and the wealthy in the framing of the political framework. So um, overwhelmingly, the new fault line is going to be, I think, over the fundamental things, the political economy, the constitutional order, and a notion of, of culture which will be between the global um, and, and the local, and the possibilities that there, there exist to articulate new forms of accountability that can change the overwhelming domination um, of, of, of the rich and the educated in the governance of the less educated and the poor. Okay, thanks, Morris. Um, Joe, your thoughts? Uh, there's no doubt that the number one political fault line is and will remain between leave uh, uh, and remain. Uh, i.e. over democracy. Um, I would say that that is the preeminent political fault line, um, uh, uh, not class, actually, although class is still very important and it intersects, it, you know, bisects a lot of issues that no doubt we're going to talk about here. Uh, and this uh, dividing line over democracy, uh, over Brexit, has superseded other political fault lines, such as party political allegiance, as um, Anand uh, mentioned, and they are driving a realignment of British politics. So we see the divisions in the Labour Party, the Conservative Party, the emergence of new parties, the Brexit Party, and to some degree, uh, exaggerated, I think, as we'll see in the election, the reinvigoration of others, such as the Liberal Democrats. Um, so what more can we say about this political fault line? Uh, we know that age and class and educational attainment are strongly correlated with Leave Remain uh, uh, support, and we've talked quite a lot about that, I think, in, in previous se uh, sessions. But we've got two distinct segments of British society with very different views of Britain and the EU, uh, and also different values. So what lies beneath this, uh, this fault line? Um, and I, I just wanted to say a bit more uh, about these opposing identities. And I'm going to present something that is a bit kind of um, schematic and so may lose some nuance in, in, in the process, but just to uh, throw out some ideas. I think what lies beneath this, uh, uh, these kind, uh, this is a kind of just a conceptual uh, thing. I think they're all interrelated. Uh, what we have, or what we've had for the past 20, 30 years um, is actually a divide or a fault line between um, uh, the idea of um, uh, governance and democracy. Um, and um, the first one, or you can call it technocracy if you want, or uh, uh, governance. Um, uh, the other side, democracy, I would say uh, the most important thing about that is political participation, which we have not really had uh, very much of um, in, in this country for, for quite a long time. And this is binary division. You know, you cannot have governance and te technocracy and a real meaningful democracy. Uh, you can't have those two things together. And the Brexit vote actually showed that this model that we've been living under for the past 30 years is unsustainable, was unsustainable, uh, and now the status quo has been called into question uh, and, and challenged. Uh, the second uh, uh, division um, uh, I, I see is between this um, uh, idea of organising politics around the kind of or, 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 uh, the perspective of uh, the supranational versus the national. Uh, or if you like, between the EU and the nation state, uh, or tutelage and sovereignty, these kind of uh, divisions. I don't think at the moment, I don't think that is binary at the moment. I don't think uh, that that is a dichotomy at the moment. I think actually it could become more so if we actually, if Brexit actually happens. And, um, but it also depends on the terms on which uh, uh, we leave the... Uh, the EU and the final division is between the idea of cosmopolitanism uh, or an outlook that is um, predicated on a kind of more cosmopolitan uh, 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 predisposition and community. I would say those are the th kind of three core uh, dividing uh, lines that lie beneath this new 
um, uh, a, a, a division fault line that we've we've seen. And I just wanted to make a few points about each of them, and that's a very quick conclusion. Yeah. If I've got time. Yeah, just a minute um, or so more. Okay. Uh, I mean, we can talk about how that's happened, you know, what this model is and how it's come about. And I think the features of it are quite clear. It's about an outsourcing of decision making from the political arena to other bodies. And I won't uh, belabor the point, which has resulted in a de democratization. Uh, of politics, and that's reflected in the academic literature as, as well, with a notable <coughs> shift to embrace non-popular models of democracy. Uh, that was Peter Mayer and Paul Whiteley and other people have talked about that. We've had convergence. We have politics are devoid of real competition uh, and, 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 and content. Uh, the key issues that are facing our country and our people have been uh, uh, decided somewhere else, taken out of the political arena. And what Brexit essentially was about was a demand for representation and change. And that divide is now out in the open, and it's a very clear one. It's, it's no new thing. Many of the best people, as they see themselves, have always been sceptical about the capacity of ordinary citizens to grasp complex issues and make critical judgments. Now, that is out in the open and it's being contested. On the supranational uh, national thing, um, uh, I won't talk about why that isn't binary at the moment, but it, it should be, it must become binary after, after Brexit. If we want to create a proper participatory, accountable, fully functioning democracy, um, which we haven't had, um, uh, that can only be accomplished really at the level of the nation state. As Professor Toombs put it very well yesterday, democracy is a somewhere phenomenon um, and uh, as opposed to an anywhere phenomenon. Um, so uh, that's just a quick point about that. The that's final fine. point on uh, the, well, cosmopolitanism versus community. I mean, it's a fine part of this kind of holy trinity. We've all read David Goodhart's Anywhere, Somewhere Divide. It wasn't only a demand for representation, the Brexit vote, and a demand to be consulted, to be invited to consider the important questions affecting them. It also represented a yearning for belonging, to be part of a community based on a common national life. And that was the positive kernel about Brexit that's often overlooked. For that moment, 17.4 million people believed in the idea of taking back control um, at the idea that the future is what we make it, what the people of this country and our government, and yes, our businesses, uh, uh, make it. And that's actually quite, uh, that's positive because uh, there was a sense of agency about it. The final point I want to make, which is very important, actually, very quickly, very quickly it's, a, it's a caveat, actually. I don't think we can actually really identify <coughs> fully what the real future uh, fault lines are going to be, because actually um, you can't have that if you don't have a really functioning democratic polity, because um, politics is about conflict, which emerge naturally in society. But if you take those issues, the really important issues, out of the arena, you know, they're never discussed, they're never developed, you know, so we don't really know what the, the real, uh, uh, d beyond this democratic one, what the real future political fault lines are going to be. But we'll find out, hopefully. Yeah, so we can bring that into the discussion. I'm kind of rushing through these because I'm very keen that we bring the audience in as quickly as possible. So, Rachel, just your thoughts yes. as well. Yes. Uh, firstly, thank you for inviting me. Um, filling in last minute for Christian May. Sorry you couldn't have him. You've got me instead. Um, there's one political fault line that I think hasn't been discussed by anyone so far in the debate about Brexit, leave and remain. Um, and that's an age one. And if you think about the, the issues that really matter to people in their day-to-day -day life, if you poll voters, which all the parties are doing, there's the NHS, there's skills, there's education, there's are they or their children going to have a good, stable job? Are they going to be able to afford a house? And you can't confront any of those issues without focusing on the implication of the fact that our population is ageing, and that is a huge societal policy shift that needs to be thought about as a whole rather than in terms of those issues. Because if you think that whether you're a Leaver or a Remainer, whatever happens with Brexit is magically going to solve all of those issues, uh, then uh, you're going to have some difficulty when whatever happens in Brexit has been resolved. 
Um, if you read the front pages today, Boris Johnson's most recent announcement, pension increase, uh, which is great for millions of pensioners, uh, Pensions already are 20% of all central government spending. Uh, the retirement age at 65. Um, so just some stats for you. In 1976, when the retirement age was 65, 14.2% of workers were over that age. So there were 4.3 working adults for every pensioner. In 2017, there were 3.5 working adults, and the forecasts are that in 2046, there'll be 2.3 working adults. So if you keep spending priorities exactly as they are, that's an 87% tax increase for every working adult in 30 years' time, just straight off the bat, 87%. Obviously, that feeds into housing as well. We know that the average age of the first-time buyer is going up. Uh, we also know that younger generations are saving less, and that's going to have huge implications for pensions as they get older. And we've also got a social care crisis, which none of the parties are considering um, well, but not this election anyway, because they saw what happened to Theresa May. Now, everyone who's young is hopefully going to grow older, and everyone who is older has young people in their life, whether they have children or not, who they care very deeply about. So this shouldn't be a societal divide. However, the uh, reluctance of politicians to date to confront this issue as a whole and to look at changing demographics means that that risks becoming a very divisive political fault line that cuts across every area of policy um, and has the potential to cut the nation in half, essentially. So while I would love for there to be a resolution on Brexit and I would love for us to reinvigorate our democracy and think harder about how we want our country to be run and who makes decisions, those are all really important things. I do think that until we can be honest about the scale of this particular challenge, that is going to keep dividing us in every area of policy. Thanks, Rachel. Um, and Anne, finally to you. Yay. How does this all... Oh, it, it just does it, you see? Brilliantly organised. Um, so I spend a lot of my time as a broadcaster, particularly often uh, standing next to Hannah and Dan at the very cold Westminster Green in the rain, e explaining to viewers against a sort of catcalls on, on both sides where we think the Brexit is heading. Probably one of the questions we're most... Uh, asked is, is this a new fault line and what does it mean for politics? So I, I gave my answer in 34 seconds flat for the networks, but every time I feel that the question is actually not a particularly good one. I think what really matters is the fault lines within these tribes that we, we've been talking about today and everybody has come at them from different angles uh, with some value. But here are some challenges to, I think, the idea of Brexit uh, as the new political fault line. Well, the first one is you don't need to have Brexit to have it. If you look at the results of the recent elections in Turing in, in Germany, admittedly of sort of quite a reactive uh, land and region of Germany, but often gives a bit of a, a direction of broader politics, you find that the main parties have been completely eclipsed and well over 50% of votes are going to Die Linke, to the AFD and the, the, the Greens. And even there, it's not a bit of a green advance. If you go west in Germany, you find the Greens do better, but you see the same pattern that the two big parties are losing out, not just losing out a bit, but losing out quite considerably. In our system, of course, that is not represented so much in the Commons, but it's an interesting thing that you can have both a different system, a much more proportional system, and no Brexit, but you still see a, a trend that's not a million miles off. I would also argue that, that France has fragmented more quietly, and the fact that the sort of dominance of Paris and the role of the presidency slightly covers up for that fact, because Macron did not, of course, get there, as, as you know, by representing a mainstream party. He invented a movement en marche. It's just that liberals <laughs> like that movement, where they don't kind of like the, the Brexit one. So one got kind of cheered and the other one didn't, but if you look at what's happened since, his consolidation has also been about treating with and coming to accommodations in part with Gilets Jaunes. He's done a very good job of cauterizing that partly by, by buying off uh, some of their issues and spending uh, 
even more on that than, than City AM, I think, would be, be very horrified by. Um, but again, you've got that same trend where the main parties seem to be having to morph or to give into something else. Uh, then we look at this sort of, well, there's Brexit and there's Remain. But is it really? I mean, people you know who are Brexit or Remain, are they, do they all feel the same, or the same strength of feeling? Me not. Uh, I would argue the really interesting divide is probably between not hard Brexit and soft Brexit, but hard Remain and soft Remain and vice versa on the other side. And that is going to be very important in this election because some of those voters will be prepared to move ground and others simply won't. So one of the big battles that I think you can see if you look at your Sunday papers today is the main parties trying to find the issues that they feel will kind of hoover away soft levers and the other way, take, take soft remainers in their direction. As a result, everyone wants to be popular, and everyone is on the mainstream political stage is deriding populism, but in fact, they are all becoming populists. The Conservatives are becoming populists by chanting more money towards the NHS without a clear reform plan. That, when did you last hear a Conservative minister speak about NHS reform with any passion or indeed any, any sign that they've been following the, the, the debate? Labour ditto just want to spend their kind of money on their kind of NHS. But it was a fantastic bit by John McDonald this morning when he said they needed to stop competition in the NHS. There should be no profiteering, as if the NHS itself could innovate itself out of uh, you know, just a genuinely difficult problem of high demand in an ageing public. Like, where was this expertise to come from? Apparently, it was all locked up in branch line hospitals. Then you come to the Lib Dems. Well, there, in fact, you have just a quite strong populist, except in a Lib Dem sort of way, populist proposal. You have ultimately, were they to form a majority, they say carefully, a revoke proposition. And that brings me to perhaps another way that the fault line, and revoking Article 50, I'm assuming we're all up to speed with that one. Um, that brings me to the fact that this Brexit, non-Brexit fault line is really much more interesting. I think there is one view of Brexit, and I would take that Lib Dem revoke, that kind of believer who wants to say that something didn't really happen in 2016, or if it did, it happened in bad faith because something was said on the side of a bus that wasn't true, or because the Russians did it, broadly speaking. And I think that is a delegitimation strategy which works for a very committed group of their potential voters, but I think it has a lot of dangers. I think it is very dangerous to say to people that when they believed that they were doing something in good faith and that they were being heard, that they were simply fools and they were being manipulated. I'm not saying, by the way, that one shouldn't look at potential sources of manipulation of elections. I'm just sceptical of the argument that it's, that's what run it. Last then you minute. see, I'm going to just come to an end, um, if I could, Mr. Chairman, am I allowed? Yeah, Half another one, minute? just one minute. <laughs> one more, one more something. That could be, long, could be a very long sentence. So then that, that brings you to the others who say, well, I, something happened, Brexit party, and it must be delivered to the letter of, of what it was that they campaigned for, except they didn't tell us what the letter of it was that they campaigned for. So you come to the really interesting bit of the fault line and the Brexit uh, side of the argument, which is effectively between Nigel and Boris. Fine chaps, both in their ways. Um, but really, in the end, one of them has had to deliver, deliver a form of Brexit which his detractors in the kind of revoke world think of as hard Brexit, but is really a kind of scrambled Brexit. And that was what he could, could get and why he's had to call an election to try and finally get it across the line. That will be a very, very important divide. We've seen Nigel Farage saying today he won't himself be a candidate. How many uh, candidates, however, the Brexit party runs is going to materially affect the Conservative outcome. So I would argue, Mr Chairman, that the fault lines are simply much more interesting uh, and uh, are telling than we think, and that they are pushing the parties, they are pushing the Labour Party we've seen pushed to the left, and I think becoming actually even more implacably so, having started out telling us occasionally it was Scandinavia, I think this is much more sort of 1917 uh, feeling in terms of revolutionary fervour. I think we will see the Liberal Democrats try to suck up that revoke-minded uh, Labour vote, and that that obviously has, has dangers for Labour. And I think we will see the Brexit vote now really being tussled for between two of the great <coughs> insurgent campaigners. Last sentence. And that is the last sentence. <laughs> thank you. Can we thank them all?
<laughs> right, I want to come straight out for, uh, and get questions and points from you. One thing I think it might be worth thinking about is just the extent to which some of the things that have come up, like class and ageing and housing um, and, and community and those sorts of issues are going to become the, the you know, the, the, the representative of the divisions, or if some of the things that Joan mentioned, like the kind of uh, fault line between technocracy and democracy, uh, supranational versus national, cosmopolitan versus community, are those going to be the new divisions? So kind of how does that all play out, and if those do become the new divisions, then what does that mean? But, um, so let's just come out for questions. Uh, we'll take a batch of them and then come back to the panel. So I'm going to start there, uh, up there with the, yes, on the edge there, and then along, <coughs> and then down. Um, in my view, Brexit was, to a significant degree, a rejection of um, traditional neoliberal and global economic policies. And so I just open the question to all members of the panel. Um, do you think that an alternative economic model, wherever it may come from, could help to repair some of these fault lines that we're identifying? Or do you think that they've cut so deep now that um, we couldn't repair it, even with some kind of alternative? OK, and can you just hand the microphone along? Thanks. Um, one of the most well-known divides that already exists in Britain is, of course, the North-South divide. Um, I was just wondering, again, to any of the panellists, uh, whether you think the Brexit vote is going to worsen that, if so, to what extent? Um, and also, with the difference in views uh, regarding Brexit in England and Wales, and then in Scotland and Northern Ireland, um, whether you think there's going to be this division between uh, those two sides as well? Again, if so, will it be a large one or a fairly unnoticeable one in the scheme of things? And there's a guy in there, just... Yes. And can you take the other microphone to the guy over there? Thanks. <laughs> yeah, uh, um, there was a lot kind of made of the kind of Brit British election study kind of talking about how you know, our politics were becoming a lot more kind of Irish and kind of Northern Irish in terms of that sort of sense that post-Brexit uh, would be very much locked into um, these kind of intractable positions. But it, I, I felt like it was a bit sort of strange that nobody really acknowledged that, you know, the nature of Irish, Northern Irish politics kind of forces that to kind of exist. It's kind of not really a, uh, something that can be easily broken out of. And it just sort of struck me as sort of slightly, you know, perhaps unbelievable to me that, that, that those kind of divisions might still exist. It might prove a kind of sort of fault line for a kind of post-Brexit um, Britain. Um, but it, I, I, I find it difficult, perhaps maybe because I have a sort of, I'm not as died in the wall, a, 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 you know, in, a, a, a Remainer as a, a, some of those fans are, that can really be a kind of foundational business. I don't know whether anyone just has any kind of thoughts about whether you think this really will, you know, be a kind of sort of scar, you know, the, the ultimate dividing line, or whether it might start to, to fall away post-Brexit. Okay, thanks. There's someone with a microphone over there. Yeah, yeah um, thank you very much. Um, my question is based on uh, a comment made to me um, just after the referendum, I think 2017, and it follows on in relation to the, the last gentleman's point about uh, the Northern Ireland border. Um, he said that he thought that he, this was a, a German diplomat based at the embassy in London. He said he thought that within 10 years the problem would resolve itself because of Anschluss. That's my word, not his, but that's what he meant. Um, does the panel have any comment on that? And does it not rather indicate that such a remark could be made that uh, there is supranational insensitivity in much of the European Union system? Thank you. OK, yes, and someone's going to make yes. I wonder why you think it's been so difficult for Britain to have a true populist party. For a while, UKIP performed that role, but as soon as Nigel Farage stepped down, that party fragmented. So then a lot of people, there was the blue wave talking about infiltrating the Tory party and trying to turn that into a populist party. It seems to me that that's gone nowhere and always would go nowhere because the Tory party is never going to be a people's party. Um, and now we have the Brexit party, which it seems to me has responded to the problems on the difficulties by, first of all, ensuring it's not a party, so it doesn't have any members, it doesn't have any branch meetings. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it talks about 
uniting the left and the right, you know, Claire Fox through to Anne Widdicombe. But it's done that simply by making sure it doesn't really have any policies. You know, all it will talk about is, is Brexit on the whole. So I think all of that, that little history shows the real difficulty of having a political party in this Britain that can truly speak for the millions of ordinary people out there. Why is that? Okay. Um, so, can we... There's someone here. Can you just take the microphone down? Keep going. Yes, there. Uh, thanks very much. Um, I wonder if you could say something about the party system and the electoral system and the capacity of these to actually represent cleavages in society. I think I, you know, I very much regret this uh, lever remain division. It, it, I would hope that we would transcend it at some point. But I think Joan's point is very insightful that when you have a system that does, not that does not effectively represent grievances in society, to a certain extent we don't quite know what those new cleavages might be. But it seems to me the, the first past the post system, the, the political parties as they stand, are also not going to be very good at representing those new cleavages. So is there just a case for saying, you know, we actually need to find out, we need to clear the ground uh, to allow new parties to come through and perhaps sweep some of these old ones away that have not served us very well at all for the last 20, 30 years? Okay. Um, let me just come back quickly to the panel then. Morris, do you want to just pick up on that last question about clearing the old away? Yeah, so, I mean, that's part... Of, yeah, oh, my apologies. It, it's partly related to the, to the first question about the alternative economic model in, in that it's, it's hard to convey the extent to which what Michael Lind called in his new book technocratic neoliberalism has dominated the policy framework and that clearly, as Lee has pointed out, is that there's a massive non-representation of grief, of exclusion, humiliation and, 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 and loads of other things going on. So the the hope and the position is obviously from my point of view is that historically during industrialization a period after industrialization um, labor the labor tradition framed a politics a politics of a redistribution of power towards workers but it was also a federal politics with a very strong uh, base uh, municipal socialism was one of the expressions um, of that and uh, within a democratic reform of a national Polity. So, it, in in many ways, the extraordinary thing is the extent to which Labour's lost its political economy, lost its federal, you know, lost its contact with its tradition. The question I ask myself is: Is there a superior tradition to work out of? Um, and my answer to that w would be: There isn't. So, that's one of the <coughs> responses. Anand, pick up on anything you want, but you can also answer, take on that as well if you want. Right, I'm going to try and do a few of them very quickly. Just pick on one and right. do it and we'll go along and then come back out. And All right, on, uh, on the political system, it strikes me that there is a problem of representation. With our electoral system, we accepted a trade-off, which was it wasn't necessarily fair, but it delivered clear, strong government, and, that, and it was worth sacrificing something to get that. If our electoral system is no longer capable of delivering what we used to call strong and stable government, then actually the trade-off is no longer worth it. And one of the things that worries me about our politics, you know, we heard earlier about the, the problem of an ageing society, and I think it is an absolutely fundamental problem, that the generational divide in our politics. If you think about the big issues that we will face beyond Brexit, which are an ageing society, social care, the NHS, the climate crisis, what they all have in common is they are long-term and cannot be fixed within the lifetime of a particular parliament. And our particular model of confrontational two-party politics where one party comes in promising to reverse what the last party has done is simply not fit for purpose for any sort of long-term problem. And I think in the years to come, it is something we need to think about because otherwise we're just going to be left languishing and unable to, to even address these issues. But not, not to caricature you, but Go is right that ahead. not a, a, a demand for something beyond democracy? <laughs> Uh, on, no, on the surface, it's a demand for a slightly different sort of politics which could conceivably be brought about by a slightly different sort of electoral system. Uh, I think it is very, very important. I think the take-back-control message of 
the referendum was about far more than taking back control from Brussels. And actually, I would like to see power devolved downwards from Westminster as well as devolved back from Brussels. So I don't think, I think actually involving people and having democracy return to something like its former health is, a, is an absolute imperative. But I think at the same time, we need to think about how we do democracy because that simple sort of antagonistic model uh, is, is, is increasingly ill-suited to the sorts of challenges we as a society yeah, no, face. No, I, I, but all I'm saying is that uh, if you look at things like uh, putting climate change bills, for example, through, mm -hmm. it seems an attempt to remove it from uh, a kind of democratic control, control process by putting it into a legal system. So it diminishes the... No, no, I'm not, uh, talking about, I'm not talking about enshrining this in some sort of beyond politics system. I'm talking about the way the House of Commons, which is the heart of our democracy, functions. Uh, so I'm not talking about... I, I think there are real dangers. I mean, Morris has touched on this and Joan has touched on this. I think the sort of technocratization of politics, the sort of there is no alternative politics has proven what dangers it holds within it, which is that popular discontent rises up and the elites don't listen. I think you have to combine the two. Joel. Yeah, the first point is I think that um, democracy without parties is unthinkable. Mm -hmm. You know, there can be no popular democracy without them. So, uh, but we need different parties. Uh, we need parties... Um, that actually really represent interests and, and that are actually uh, address important issues, uh, that have ideas, and finally, that have a, rela a relationship with, with people and, 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 and the society. And, and uh, what's happened to um, the political system in this country and in Europe, as uh, Anne has, has pointed out, we've seen the same process. I mean, we've got this particular British form uh, of populism, um, you know, and we all know why that is, um, uh, in the UK that's taken the form of Brexit, but in other places, exactly the same dealignment is, is going on and discontent about uh, the political uh, system. So one thing is what sort of parties, our parties are no longer fit for purpose, uh, I mean, I, I'll come back and say, but the, the, the main point I want to make actually is what is the proper role for the public um, uh, today? Um, I, the most important point, I think, is the quality of any democracy depends finally on the questions that are put to the people. You know, we don't, um, it's, we, in a modern, complex democracy, 70 million people here, however many hundreds of millions in the US, you know, what is the proper role for the, the, the public to play? It's got to be more, you know, than a, an, a, a, the, a vote every, you know, four years or, or, or five years um, elsewhere. There has to be more engagement, and it's the... Uh, uh, in order for that to happen in a way where you're not expecting people every day of their lives to be involved in, I mean, I know everybody likes Brexit and, you know, we can't get enough of it and everything, but we, you know, the public doesn't want to do this all the time, forever, every day of the week. So, uh, but it wants more than what it's had, you know, for the past uh, a few decades. And that really depends on politics being competitive on political parties really being representative. And if, you know, saying why haven't we had something new, that's, it will come. Um, uh, uh, you know, it's, it, what is amazing is that um, these parties are still there. When, the, you know, 10% of people think that the Labour Party represents the working class now, yet this is the party, you know, that's meant to represent that uh, uh, constituency. So they will... Uh, fall away. But when you've had a quiescent electorate and a quiescent politics for so long, it's going to take time. But this rupture is the start, hopefully, of, of, of a change. And it is happening. And I know we're all impatient for it to um, uh, get a move on. Um, but it, it, it will come. Rachel and Anne, unless you've anything burning, I'm just going to go oh, okay. straight out and then we're going to okay, I'll come the back round. to you two first yeah, next great. time. So let's do another round. So can we start down here? And then go to that guy there, and then that guy there, and then over there, and up the back. Oh, sorry, and the whole load down here. Yes, um, uh, I'd be interested in, uh, in the panel's uh, thoughts on, on this, uh, as a, what's been suggested as a fault line in the UK, which I think is a, is a false fault line, uh, a slur in my view, which is um, 
It's about the division between being open and being closed. Um, so I had a letter, received a letter from Sadiq Khan, which I'm sure many Londoners, fellow Londoners received uh, this weekend, saying that uh, I should support my local Labour Party candidate because my local Labour Party candidate was open and not closed. And by that, I believe that he means to cast a slur against the Leave vote and Leave voters that they are closed, i.e. they're xenophobic, uh, you know, anti-foreign, uh, anti, uh, anti-immigration. Um, whereas all of the studies that I understand have been conducted on this, uh, the EU's own searchlight studies show, and I'm happy to be corrected on, on this, is that the UK uh, is the most welcoming to immigrants uh, and immigration uh, out of the uh, EU uh, 28. Uh, and um, so it seems like, it feels like it's a slur, and I think maybe mm. I'd be interested if the panel could spend some time maybe rubbishing some of these other false dichotomies, uh, and, um, and, and then maybe we can get to the, 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 the meat of, of what the uh, actual fault lines in the future will be. Okay, thanks. Yes. Um, the one thing that political parties across the Western world since around 2012 have uh, really started to grasp is that typical voters, and particularly voters that are more likely to sway elections, hold oppositional views between their cultural and economic preferences. That if you are to the cultural right, you tend to be to the economic left and vice versa. And this was discussed a bit towards the end of the day yesterday. I just wondered in what ways do you think this means that established political parties are going to have to sort of uh, adapt their economic messages in particularly for them what would be undesirable ways in order to sort of attract these new pool of voters and make sure that they can harness this oppositional cultural economic divide. Yes, over there. And can that one go back to the next person? Yes. Um, I wonder if one of the um, dividing lines, which I think is kind of being hinted at on the panel, is uh, between um, Brexit on the one hand and the day-to-day -day issues that touch people's lives that they really care about, things like the NHS, transport, and all of this kind of stuff. Because it seems to me like it's a bit of a false opposition, that. Because I think the public have taken a huge gamble and a huge risk, bigger than the politicians, uh, political classes are willing to take by voting for the unknown. And can we not harness some of that spirit and some of that daring and tackle some of those other day-to-day -day problems that tackles people's lives? Can we not bring some of the same sense of radicalism and experimentation to those problems as well? Okay, thanks. Um, yes. Yes, um, I would like to ask about two possible fault lines that haven't been mentioned so far. Um, the first one is the State of the Union. Um, given that the fact that a possibility of a United Kingdom of England and Wales is not entirely fictional right now, and I'm not talking just about Scottish people and Northern Irish people, but also about half people on this side of the border field about such an outcome. And the second one is um, whether you think the discussion about uh, the need for a codified constitution is going to arise at some point. Okay, and one more for just now, yes. Just following on from that excellent point about um, harnessing radical energy, does the panel think anyone in the current political scene has the balls, male or female, um, <laughs> to um, admit that the NHS structure isn't working and we need to find a new way to fund the NHS? Because at the moment it looks like no one will, will say that, and that's a big key to the intergenerational crisis. Okay, can I come to you, Anne, for this, the, f yep. the first question, actually, the, the, the open and close question. And yeah, is it, is it sort of time, time to admit now that actually Britain is uh, fairly open to, to immigrants and immigration, mm -hmm. albeit within a desire to control how that happens? Well, uh, open and closed, I think the economists sort of interrogated this, and in some pieces we have sort of respect that description but we do often sort of point out that it is a bit it, it's a bit of a kind of marketing political marketing trope as well which is the way that you were referring to that Sadiq Khan was using it why because open is just better than closed isn't it I mean do you want the restaurant open do you want it closed right <laughs> yeah. so 
so like, you know, often when things are, it's a bit like sort of neoliberalism. It's like, you know, can we just like call it classical liberal economics that you don't like when you put neo in front of it? So there's a lot of marketing going on here uh, in this argument. I thought the challenge was very good. I think there's some truth in it. Britain is uh, historically more open. But it is a little bit of a trick, I think, if you're arguing from the sort of you like the sort of open agenda and you're Sadiq Khani or you're kind of making that sort of left liberal case to say we are open. Well, are you really? I mean, are you so open that you don't have any worries about immigration? Really? Because that seemed to get you into quite a difficult place. So I suspect that people are preaching open but looking at kinds of constraint and you can see that Labour policy struggling precisely on this issue about immigration. You get a great you know, fondness for freedom of movement but then you can see, all around, you look around the EU and you see lots of people trying to trim bits off it. So even those cultures that like to call themselves politically open are often finding ways to close a little bit early sometimes. Um, that, I just think I'd be a little bit careful with that, that sort of... Should we just on, in fairness on the other side say you, know, you do have to take care uh, when you say we are marvellous, we are open, we are welcoming. Well, in that case, you know, you better watch your rhetoric and you better watch uh, the rhetoric in Parliament and beyond because it's quite easy also to, to sort of end up in a political culture where your language and a sort of way of, of channeling the language and political passions that go with it can make you sound unwelcoming, uh, even if overall you are welcoming. So I'd okay. have it both ways. Am I allowed to say something else? No, not just now. I'll come back to you. Um, it's very Rachel. tough here, isn't it? Yeah, we've got it, it's very a little kind time. of, sort of Soviet strict. system. <laughs> Rachel, um, yes. uh, Rachel, I, I wondered if you can just take on this point here about about um, uh, we've gone through this process of of effectively voting for a leap into the unknown, yep. which is kind of quite a radical and uh, you know a positive thing to do in many ways. Um, so, fr from your perspective, you know, as someone who writes about business and, and uh, uh, innovation and uh, technology, is that not a good place to be? Is, is there a way of kind of harnessing that? that of course, move. of course it is. Uh, the energy and the enthusiasm that we've seen uh, from the public, the engagement is really positive. The fact that it's got us talking about what kind of country we want to be and what kind of future we want to have, that's really positive too. And the fact that it's shaken up the major political parties, I think we can all agree that's a good thing. Um, I want to actually defend the major parties here because there's a lot of talk that's implying that um, they're, they're useless and we need new parties and they haven't changed, of course they've changed. The Conservative Party today is not the Conservative Party of 100 years ago. Same with Labour. Parties go through... Uh, evolutions and it's painful and it's messy and they split uh, but the way our democracy works is we're primarily a two-party system and that means it's not that other views are shut out from parliament it's that they're contained within the parties and those battles are internal and then every so often uh, the, the balance shifts and we've seen that with Labour shifting to a, a further left point of view than Blairism and we've seen it in the Conservatives too. Um, and I also want to defend uh, first past the Post as a system, um, I agree that it hasn't been working at the moment, but if you look at other forms of proportional representation, look at Germany, where the two major parties both lost a huge amount of their vote share, um, they had long discussions with each other, sort of two weeks later they came out and said, right, you voted, we're now going to tell you who your government's going to be, and it's a coalition between the two major parties. You look at Israel, that has sort of very, very very direct proportional representation, a huge amount of power goes to fringe one issue parties who get to dominate the debate perhaps more than they should. Do we want a single issue party like the Greens, for example, or like the Brexit party that doesn't have a manifesto or a set of policies, um, just has one issue influencing politics. The reason our political system is set up the way it is, is to try and avoid that. Now, it hasn't been working, um, but the reason it hasn't been working is we have this god-awful law, the Fixed Term Parliament Act, which um, prevents the natural mechanism for which we've dealt with this over the centuries-long history of our parliament, which, if it's not working, have an election. We saw that in the 70s. It was a bit unstable steady and uncertain for a while, had a couple of elections, eventually sort of uh, certainty filled the, the power void. What we've got is we've, we've, we've invented a system where we've hamstrung our democracy's only mechanism to reinvent itself. So I think scrap the Fixed Term Parliament Act and you will see the evolution within the parties to something positive. 
Okay, I'm going to take Morris in quickly on, on what you want to come into, then Joan in quickly on globalisation. Yeah, it's just to bring in this open, closed, how, how silly it is. Um, any, any system has to be simultaneously open and closed. There has to be some interpretive and institutional framework within which you make judgments in, or, in order to function in a plural environment. So the very dichotomy of open um, and closed um, is, actu is actually malicious in some way, as, as mendacious, I would say, rather, rather than just silly. And then if you look at, at Joan's points about democracy, sovereignty, community and participation, they all involve some degree of exclusivity, of membership, of belonging and of attachment. So we're, we're in danger of, of saying that unless a system is absolutely universal, it's, it's prejudiced or e exclusionary in some way. So I just wanted to, and the, and the other thing to, to make the point is that those ideas of democracy, community, and participation are precisely the ways that you renew our polity. Those are the fundamental ways in which you make a system both closed and open and functional. Okay, Joan, quickly on uh, globalisation. Then I'm going to come out for one big last round of questions when we'll get everyone in that wants to speak, and we'll come back for sort of final thoughts. So, Joan. Well, I thought I'd just try and tie in a few questions that were asked. Was one about North-South divide? Was this um, Brexit a rejection of globalisation, neoliberalism? Uh, yeah, a few other related class questions about class. Um, uh, the way I look at it is um, the primary driver of the Brexit vote was a political one. It was, like I said, about demand for representation, dissatisfaction with the status quo. Um, but there's no doubt, you know, that, that so there's a democratic political dimension. There's no doubt there was an economic dimension to it um, as well. I mean, North-South divide is not just North-South divide. I mean, we're talking about the, you know, most of the country, actually, the Midlands, the Northwest, the Northeast, you know, the Southwest, um, e e even outer uh, London and Essex. This is, you know, there's a lot of, um, it, 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 there is a two nations, you know, uh, uh, aspect to, uh, to this um, that encompasses inequality, that encompasses questions about our crap infrastructure and the fact that that hasn't been addressed, about our uh, perennially low productivity, our lack of investment in innovation and, and, and so on. And the point I want to make about Brexit, because everybody avoids this, everybody's trying to make the political democratic case for Brexit, Nobody is, everybody's so defensive about making the economic case for it, as if you can't make it in the face of project fear. You actually, you know, ruptures are good for politics, shaking up uh, politics. They can also be good in the economic sphere as well. Uh, you know, and there, are, we, there can be economic benefits to taking control of your own affairs. Um, and, um, you know, if we look at the problems that we need to address, you know, there is a growth deficit here, not just in the Eurozone and the EU. We might have been growing faster than the Eurozone uh, in, since the crisis period it set for last year, um, but it's hardly anything to write home about. Uh, and we need to address that question of growth through addressing these things that are actually in people's real day-to-day -day lives causing uh, uh, massive problems. And if I had time, I'd, I'd say a bit more about that. It's not all... Trade is important. It's not everything. There's a lot of other things that are, drive long-term growth. Um, and if we actually address those problems, over the long term, Brexit actually can be good for the UK, for UK growth, and not just for uh, uh, democracy. Okay, so I'm coming back out. There was uh, someone up back up there had their hand up, and I think at the microphone. Me. And then, can I just see, get a sense of how many other people that need, want to speak? Okay, so we'll get you all in, no problem. Yes, go on. Hi, this was just a, a small point about something Rachel made. Uh, Rachel pointed out earlier about that 87% tax increase, which horrified me. Um, now, taking that a bit broader, not just with the ageing population, but with the Tories turning on the spending taps, left, right and centre, more and more people being taken out of taxation altogether. Is there going to be a fault line between an ever-dwindling sort of net contributor class to the public purse and a, an increasing beneficiary class almost? Is that going to be a new fault line? Okay. 
and some right at the back with the white t-shirt with the Battle of Ideas t-shirt. Hi there. Um, I would argue that uh, the fault lines are going to remain the same because at the end of the day, the EU is not powerful enough and wonderful enough to change all, you know, being in it doesn't make all our problems get fixed and the same, those problems that cause the Brexit vote when we leave the EU, if we do, um, we're not suddenly going to have the power to fix them. You know, these are internal domestic issues and our membership of the EU is just a foreign policy issue, really. It's not, the EU is not some humongous force that dictates how we run our country. It, it really isn't. I'm sorry. We have got far more influence than we're led to believe in the running of our country and who we elect. And the same problems, you know, that the same problems in the towns and areas that have voted for leave are going to remain, okay. whether in the EU or not. Okay, thank you. Can we bring the microphone down this way? There's a lady there in the black. And can the other microphone come right down over here? Thank you. I'm reminded that during the referendum campaign, there were, um, there were two strong strands coming through from people who were planning to vote leave. Yes, one was two fingers up to the establishment, but the other feeling came across very strongly um, from people across the age range, was this country needs a bloody big kick up the backside. And there was this awful feeling that we, we were losing energy, that we weren't able to address any of our problems, that, as I say, we needed a kick up the backside. And the only way that we were going to face up to our responsibilities to create our country and rectify, our, rectify the problems was to get out of the EU and shake up the economics shake up a number of things. I think we really have a great big opportunity if only we seize it. Can I just add a couple of things? No. I think we're no. beginning. No. Sorry, <laughs> you we're can't. We're beginning to see There's other people that, want that to speak. both the major parties are slowly beginning to respond to the need for change. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Uh, just a sort of reformulation of a question that was asked a moment ago, but I don't think the panel picked up on it. Um, do, w will the, uh, the new fault lines result in new hybrid politics, so more left conservatism, more blue-collar uh, blue conservatism and so on? Okay, and over there. Um, Lord Glasman um, stated earlier that there could be a change versus communitarian versus more individualistic and globalist um, policies in the fault line could change there. Is there, does the panel think there's any room, I know it's hard within the first path of the post system, for any party that embodies that, or a new kind of political fringe that embodies that to come through and through some of the more mainstream <coughs> politics, similar to like the Social Democratic Party is now starting to pick up some speed in the grassroots. Okay, uh, just the lady in front and then I'll come to the guy in the white shirt. <coughs> and that's about it, so maybe uh, just sort of think about some concluding, short concluding remarks, what your priorities might be as a response to these emerging fault lines would be uh, one good thing to put forward, but yes. Ready? Right. What I want out of Brexit will probably be good for the economy. I'll start with workers' rights. They are better under, you, under EU, uh, our laws than the EU. I want to see the rights of animals, no longer to travel than great distances to slaughter, vaccinate cows against TB, and let pigs eat the lovely swill they always love. And I'd like to see the right of people to be able to work until at least 70. It's fun. And all this IT work is done sitting down. <laughs> OK, thank you. And... Very jolly. Hello there. <laughs> Finally, guy in the white shirt there. Uh, I'm standing for the Brexit Party as MP in Carshalton and Wallington. Hands up the people who have heard of or know where that constituency is. Well, I'm, I'm surprised because it is up north, down south. It is neglected. It is left behind. It is somewhere, but not necessarily where you'd like to be. And let me tell you one thing. The people who are coming up to our stall in Carshalton and Wallington know that Boris's deal is rubbish. They know that. 
right? And that's something to consider, since Anne rightly talks about the divisions within the Leave camp. I have a question for the panel, though, which is one of the policies of the Brexit party, we do have a few for a party that's been around a few weeks, is to abolish the House of Lords. How do you feel about that, Lord Glassman? <laughs> <laughs> because I'm telling you, it's playing very well in our blue Labour seat, right? So maybe the best policy for you is to abolish yourself and, and we can all go forward in a spirit right, of democracy. All right. So, um, this is just final, f final few remarks. Uh, about a minute each, I think I can give you. Um, should we just go along, starting with you, Rachel? Um, the person up there uh, who said, is leaving the EU going to magically solve all our problems? Um, no. And one of the things that I think is one of the biggest challenges for us going forward is that whatever happens that's negative, uh, people who voted Remain will blame it all on Brexit. Uh, and there is also, though, the risk that I think Brexit will happen once it's happened, uh, that a government that manages to achieve it thinks, OK, job's done. Uh, it won't fix the NHS crisis. It won't fix the ageing population crisis. It won't fix the infrastructure crisis. It may help free up the time to do all of those things, but that's the starting point, and then we we have to work harder. And I think we spent this whole debate talking about Brexit and that as a political fault line in a year or two years' time. That is not what is going to matter. That is not what is going to matter most to people in their day-to-day -day lives. There are much more important things out there, and we need to be thinking about those. And I have one positive note to end on on my ageing population. Uh, go back to the beginning. The person who's going to live to 150 in this country has already been born we think. Um, people are going to be, uh, have multi-stage lives to retrain multiple times in their life. The arc of our lives is going to change. That is a huge amount of potential, of uh, untapped, promising uh, potential that if we get the policies right now could reshape society. Can we please think about that and not just about leaving the EU? Okay, thank you, Richard. <laughs> Joan. Yeah, I agree that EU is not the problem but it's part of the problem, and it will be helpful when we leave it because it will, um, uh, our own politicians will then be held to account and will not be able to evade um, uh, accountability. Um, but it takes, you know, it takes a bit more than that, I think, as well. And my question is, Brexit, to what purpose? You know, why, Boris, uh, do we want to get Brexit done? Uh, is it, yeah, to take back control? of our democracy and our politics. Um, that's not something that's just going to happen. Uh, uh, democracy is work, you know, hard work, um, and it does depend on uh, uh, the mobilization of people who've been energized by um, uh, the, the, the Brexit vote. And, and then finally, to what purpose democracy? Um, you know, the, uh, democracy is on the one hand uh, about how the people can exercise control over government in a meaningful way. Um, but it's also an experiment which doesn't stop uh, in uh, the creation of a community and in the, uh, first of all, politicisation uh, of conflict and socialisation of conflict and resolution of conflict. That's what that is, should be the bread and butter uh, of politics. So that's, that's the aim. Thanks, Joe. Um, Anna, your final thoughts. I just want to come back to that question about blue collar conservatism. Uh, you can sort of see it in, in, in rhetorical outlines since the election of 2017 that the Conservatives have tried to park their tanks on Labour lawn but not actually delivered on anything they've said in that direction. What will be crucial is if, if an electoral strategy targeted at winning traditional Labour seats works, the nature of the Conservative Party will have to change because those MPs in Parliament representing those seats will say, we need policies for our people. So actually that, that realignment, that emergence of a different sort of conservatism will happen if they find themselves representing the sorts of seats they haven't represented for an awfully long time, at which point it will change. But it, a lot will hinge then on the outcome of the election. 
Yeah, I think I'd like to sort of question an earlier narrative there where we'd end up with a, a very different kind of electoral system or party landscape. I think, you know, if you look at the fact that even under the strains of now, two main parties together still accounting, at least as polling standing at the moment, for well over 50% of the vote. They may be more robust than we think. I agree with Anna, and I think they will change what they are and what they do. It's a bit of a 1905 sort of gawky moment, you know, that something is going to happen. You don't know if you're going to like it when you get it. Uh, but it doesn't surprise me that a lot of people who like PR systems think that this is their moment. One thing I would say about it, any PR-based system or its alternatives, alternative vote-based system, is a lot better uh, at representing different interests than it is in bringing them together. And many of the same fault lines that we've touched on in really interesting questions uh, tonight would immediately recur, not least a bit like, I mean, if you look even to the, you know, the area of getting a second referendum underway, people's votes gone the full fight club. I mean, you know, that would be as nothing uh, as against if you decided that you just want to throw it up in the air and change your electoral system. It might happen, but it wouldn't be, be painless. I think the parties, however, will change. And obviously, if Labour won, then their, some of their prospectus would have been uh, at least proven until they, they had a chance to, to get into way in government and sort it out and see what, what they made of it. I think it would be very difficult. But if they lose, well, I think it's good by Jeremy Corbyn in a journey back towards a sort of uh, social democratic uh, leftist mainstream. Ditto the fight between uh, Brexit Party and the Conservatives. The parties will change. They will have to, uh, they will definitely be more northern oriented. And a final word as someone comes from the, the, the northeast. When I hear politicians talking about the north, it always makes me laugh. And I think we've got two northerners at least on the panel. Three, I think. Because if uh, anyone is uh, aware of the role that the Pennines plays between the northeast uh, and the northwest. So I think we will look at regional difference, not only in a, in a fairly crass way between the north and the south. We might actually have got to know our own country a bit more. For that alone, I think it's been a really fascinating uh, three years. All right. Thanks, Anne. Um, <laughs> Morris, uh, your final thoughts? Yeah, Last sorry. word to you. Oh, yeah. So I'll begin with saying that I have... Um, campaigned and articulated for my own abolition. And I think that the, <laughs> my, my, my view is that the commons should be democracy locational and the Lords should be vocational, where people are elected from their areas of expertise and their work. But just to go back to the general question, there is going to be a, a reconfiguration and a rearticulation and all successful political projects are paradoxical. They combine mutually conflicting elements. So I do think, you know, to pick up on these things, that the new politics will be both radical and conservative. It will be patriotic and internationalist. There's got to be a way in which there's a reconciliation of the secular and the religious and the locational and, and the vocational. The, the crucial thing is to be able to articulate some sense of national renewal and the political party that will be able to do that will, will win. Thanks very much.